Good morning. Good morning. All right. Good morning and welcome to worship. Glad to have everyone here with us. Um, One quick kind of housekeeping thing. Do we have spotlight? Oh, okay. There we go. It just seemed a little different. Anyways, uh, welcome to worship. Glad to have you here with us. And let there be light. Oop, there we go. Timed out perfectly. It timed out well, didn't it? Uh, so Lauren's got some announcements. Fire away. Yellow mic. Yellow mic. There we Am go. I on? All righty. Good morning. I have just a couple of um, quick announcements today. Um, spirit group today, we will have a lunch and an activity here. We will be done by 1.30. So if you are in kindergarten through fifth grade, please join us for that. Um, picture Lent this week. I forgot what it is. Who wants to tell me our topic for Picture Lent? What is it? Anybody? Prayer. Um, yeah, so this week, if you will text or email me a picture of is there a place you like to pray, some things that you pray for, especially during Lent, um, that will be very nice of you and awesome to look at outside on our picture Lent display. If you haven't stopped by there, um, you should really do that on your way out. It is beautiful. Um, on a Monday, the Joy Group will have a lunch here. Um, John, are you out there? John Ackles? Does it start at 1130? Joy Group? 11 o'clock, we're going to have a lunch and their birthday party. Yep, so bring pickups to share and a 3 to $5 gift to exchange for the gift game. Um, please note that the dates of Vacation Bible School have changed this year. It's now going to be the third week in July, um, and our Savior will be the host, so please note that change. Today, right after church, if you are attending the Welka Retreat next weekend, um, just meet right here um, in the sanctuary. Sandy will lead a quick meeting for you guys, just a few notes before we leave. And also, um, right after church, there will be an Easter egg hunt planning meeting. So if you are interested in helping with the egg hunt this year, head to the parlor, and we will have a meeting in there. And I think that is everything that I have. All right, the only uh, announcement of which, oh, John's got something. It's a pretty good sized flagpole, right, John? Um, 25 feet, I think. 25 feet? 30, 30. So, a pretty good size uh, flagpole. So, yet, there are people that want to help out. Uh, that would be greatly appreciated. Uh, The only other announcement of which I am aware is we have youth choir practice uh, downstairs immediately following worship. Um, uh, Louise? Children are singing today. Okay, so children's choir practice is after church as well uh, downstairs. Up here, right here? Right there. So right to church... uh,
Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from whom no secrets are hid. Cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Let us confess our sin in the presence of God and of one another, Amen. kneeling as we're able. Gracious God, have mercy on us. We confess that we have turned from you and given ourselves into the power of sin. We are truly sorry and humbly repent. In your compassion, forgive us our sins, known and unknown, things we have done and things we have failed to do. Turn us again to you and uphold us by your spirit, so that we may live and serve you in newness of life, through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. God, who is rich in mercy, loved us even when we were dead in sin, and made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. In the name of Jesus Christ, your sins are forgiven. Almighty God, strengthen you with power through the Holy Spirit, that Christ may live in your hearts through faith. Amen. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. And also with you. Let us pray. Holy God, through your Son, you have called us to live faithfully and act courageously. Keep us steadfast in your covenant of grace and teach us the wisdom that comes only through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. We invite our children to come forward to sing at this time.
The first reading is from the 20th chapter of Exodus. God spoke all these words. I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself an idol, whether in the form of anything that is in heaven above or that is on the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or worship them. For I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, punishing children for the iniquity of parents to the third and fourth generation of those who reject me, but showing steadfast love to the thousandth generation of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not make wrongful use of the name of the Lord your God, for the Lord will not acquit anyone who misuses his name. Remember the Sabbath day and keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. But the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. You shall not do any work. You, your alien, honor your father and your mother so that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or male or female slave or ox or donkey or anything that belongs to your neighbor. Word of God, word of life. Thanks be to God. The second reading is from 1 Corinthians, the first chapter. The message about the cross is foolishness to those who are perishing, 
But to us who are being saved, it is the power of God. For it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. God decided through the foolishness of our proclamation to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks desire wisdom. But we proclaim Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those who are the called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For God's foolishness is wiser than human wisdom and God's weakness is stronger than human strength. Word of God, word of life. Gospel according to St. John, the second chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When the Passover of the Jews was near, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem, in the temple he found people selling cattle, sheep, and doves, and the money changers seated at their tables. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple, both the sheep and the cattle. He also poured out the coins of the money changers and overturned their tables. He told those who were selling the doves, take these things out of here. Stop making my false marketplace. One of my favorite movies to watch is the best Christmas pageant ever. Anybody ever seen it? Fantastic. Where? The Herbmans were dirty, they were smelly, and nobody liked being around them. And one day they showed up at the church and decided that they wanted to be in the annual Christmas pageant. And as it turned out, all of them wound up with the leading parts. And so everybody hopped on the phones, and there was that, that great little scene in the movie where they had the, the, the four-way cut out, and everybody's on the phone talking. I'll tell you that's the pastor's nightmare right there. That's what keeps us up in the middle of the night. Is the... Only something different happened that year. It turned out being the best Christmas pageant ever. The robes and the costumes weren't quite as nicely pressed as they always were. Mary and Joseph, the wise men and the shepherds, were all a little bit dirtier and, quite frankly, smellier than they normally were. The pageant was a bit more unruly than it normally was, but for the first time in years, it seemed like, because of that reorientation, everything was real and not quite as staged as it had once been before. It's funny, sometimes in life we hit those points where we need to be reoriented, where we need to be jarred from our comfort, comfortable, ordinary existence to see life in a fresh and new way. It's what happened in our text from John today. Life had become somewhat comfortable, ordinary, expected. Everybody knew just how everything worked. If you wanted to have an encounter with the divine, if you wanted to be absolutely 100% certain that you had, had been near the divine and that the divine had heard your prayers, 
You would get up from wherever your house was and walk however far it was. It might be a couple of miles or it might be a several day journey over to the temple. And there as you saw that huge white marble building off in the distance, you knew that there you were seeing the very household of God, that God was there. When you saw it, you had certainty that God was there. And if you wanted to know that God heard your prayers, then you went into the temple courtyard and you went to one of the places that was selling the approved sacrificial animals. You took your your Roman money that was deemed, uh, quite frankly, to be not fit for God's house and you changed it around for good, holy money. There's a good job right there, isn't it? Someone was thinking there. And then you go buy your dove or your goat or your lamb or whatever it was that you needed to sacrifice that day and you would, you'd exchange your money for it and you'd take it to the, the temple priest and they would sacrifice it and you could see the smoke rising, you could smell the, the smells and you would know with absolute certainty that God was there, that God was present in your life, and that God heard whatever it was that, that you had to say to him. And quite frankly, it's a very nice system, if we're honest. You have a 100% guarantee that God is there and present, and that God is listening to the things that you, that you want. And there was a whole system. There were sights and sounds and smells and even money to guarantee that God was there present for you. And make no mistake, this gave people a tremendous sense of comfort. It was ordinary, it was expected, it was normal, it was comfortable. Until one day, when Jesus and his band of herdmen's walked into God's holy house, and they overturned everything, flipping over tables and driving out animals and hooting and hollering and shouting and all that kind of stuff. Because you see, while this, while this had been comfortable, while this had been expected, while this was normal for people, it was also becoming corrupt. You see, if you're doing this money-changing business and you've got the holy money and they've got the not-so-holy money, well, maybe you make the conversion rate work in your favor. Oh, and by the way, that holy money doesn't really spend anywhere other than the temple, whereas that unholy money, well, that's accepted everywhere. It's kind of like American Express everywhere you want to be. So it kind of worked out in their favor if you were a money changer to the detriment of the good, faithful pilgrims that were coming to the temple. Then there was the business of these sacrificial animals. You had to have just the right one. They couldn't have any blemish on them. They had to have the the stamp of approval from the priest that said, this is a good animal. And well, that costs a lot of money, you know, to raise just the right animal and to take care of it in just the right way and to get the right stamp of approval from the right priest to make sure everything's on the up and up and that God will actually hear your prayers. So we're not going to sell you this for, quite frankly, all that cheap. We're going to well, gouge you just a little bit. So Jesus knew that while this was a comfortable system, a system that gave people all kinds of hope, he also knew that this was a broken system. And one that while giving hope on the front end was taking away hope on the back end. Oh, and by the way, this whole system of hope and comfort at this point was only about 40 some odd years from completely falling apart. The temple would fall in about 40 years from from this scene right here and would be no more and to this day hasn't been rebuilt. Reorientation was needed. And so Jesus, 
and his band of disciples doing their best herdman's impersonation cleansed the temple. Now, there's something I find really fascinating about this text, something that just kind of makes my brain think in different ways. Who were the bad guys in the text? Were they the sacrificial animals or were they the money changers and the people that were selling the, the, uh, the sacrificial animals? Yeah, it was the people that were the bad, the bad guys. You know, the, the, the little money, that's in a, inanimate objects. That can't be inherently good or bad. It just is. The animals, well, they're just being animals. They can't decide, oh, we want to overturn everybody's religious beliefs or something like that. They're just being animals. It's the people that are selling the animals, that are changing the money. They're the ones that are corrupting this whole system. Yet who is it that Jesus drives out of the temple? Hmm? It's just the animals. Making a whip of cords, he drove all of them out of the temple. That could sound like like everybody, but the next, after the comma, it clears it up. Both the sheep and the cattle. Who Jesus drives out isn't the people, it's the sheep and the cattle that he drives out. And in fact, we know that he didn't drive the people out. Why? Yeah, because he talks to them. There are people to actually talk to after that fact. Now, in all reality, up until about this week, I was pretty sure that he drove everybody out, but in reality, if we take the text seriously, who he drove out was the sheep and the cattle. The people, sinners and all, were left behind because they had something that they needed to hear. They needed to hear that Jesus was reorienting this whole system of how it is that you relate to the divine. Again, it used to be you had to go to the temple to be connected to the divine. It used to be that you had to pay the right amount of money and get the right sacrificial animal to have an encounter with the divine. But now Jesus is saying, oh no, this works in a very different way now. Jesus is saying, I am the divine one. I'm the one that you connect with. I'm the one that you have encounters with. And oh, by the way, you don't have to shell out all of your money to have an encounter with the divine. That sounds really great, doesn't it? That's got to get an amen and a hallelujah, right? And here's the thing. You don't have to just go to one particular place, a place called Jerusalem, to have an encounter with the divine. You can have an encounter with the divine right here. Or you can have an encounter with the divine at home, over coffee in a devotional. You can have an encounter with God while walking in the grandeur of nature. Or you can have a, an encounter with God while you're caring for one of those animals, a sheep or a cattle. A sheep or a cattle, that's terrible grammar, gosh. If we take my, one of my more recent newsletter articles seriously, you can even, like me, have an encounter with the divine while fixing the commode. I assure you, I did mention God several times. Sometimes those bolts are really kind of tough. The reality is that God is not boxed up. God is not kept somewhere where we can keep him nice and safe and distant from us. God's on the loose. He's out in the world. He's everywhere. Again, kind of like American Express, he's everywhere you want to be, and quite frankly, everywhere you don't want him to be. Wherever it is that you go, there God is. Every single solitary last moment of our lives is filled with holiness. Everything that we do from changing diapers to typing reports at work, our commute, grocery shopping, whatever it might be, is absolutely filled with God. 
Every moment of your life is a holy, sacred moment. And every place that you go is holy ground. On one hand, it's a little bit scary to think that everywhere that you go is holy and sacred. Because we've all been taught that you try to act your best at church, but if I have to act my best at church, that means I have to act my best everywhere else. That can be scary. But at the same time, the comfort and the peace that we get from God can be had each and every moment of each and every day, no matter where we are. The handiwork of God is written on everything, in the stars and the clouds and the rocks and the rivers, in a cubicle behind the windshield of a car, wherever it is. Jesus has reoriented our life that it's not necessarily about places and things that make life holy, but it's all places and things and people. Again, not just particular people and places and things, but all people and places and things have the divine spark, have the touch of holiness, and fill our lives each and every day. But that would say amen and thanks be to God. Using the words of the Nicene Creed, we believe in one God, the Father, the Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, of all that is seen and unseen. We believe in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only Son of God, eternally begotten of the Father, God from God, light from light, true God from true God, begotten not made, of one being with the Father. Through him all things were made. For us and for our salvation, he came down from heaven, was incarnate of the Holy Spirit and the Virgin Mary, and became truly human. 
For our sake he was crucified under Pontius Pilate. He suffered death and was buried. On the third day he rose again, in accordance with the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again in glory to judge the living and the dead, and his kingdom will have no end. We believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son is worshipped and glorified, who has spoken to the prophets. We believe in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We acknowledge one baptism for the forgiveness of sins. We look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. With the whole people of God in Christ Jesus, let us pray for the church, those in need, and all of God's creation. We give you thanks, O God, that you have reoriented our lives around your Son, Jesus, filling all things with your holiness. Give us courage and faith as we go along our pilgrim way, now and always. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks for those who are called to stand in harm's way on our behalf, for our first responders and those in the military. Especially we pray for Jordan, Caleb, Garrett, Kendall, Jake, John, Austin, Mark, Thor, Daniel, and Hunter. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks for those who are called to use the healing touch, even as they care for those who are sick in mind, body, or spirit. We pray especially for Carolyn, Ted, Francis, Pauline, John, Addie, Nellie, Todd, Doug, Sally, Janice, Linda, Marty, Gary, Jean, Lou, Glenn, Michael, David, Joshua, Elaine, Kay, Henry, Jean, Danny, Stephen, Becky, Bob, Kay, and those who name the ladder on our lips are silently in our hearts. Lord, in your mercy. We give you thanks to God for those who have lived and served you and who now rest from their labors. Make us certain that because Christ lives, we shall live also. Lord, in your mercy. Into your hands, gracious God, we commend all for whom we pray, trusting in your mercy through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The peace of the Lord be with you always. Let us share a sign of Christ's peace with one another. We continue our worship with the giving of our tithes and offerings.
So Jesus, you brought heaven down. My sin was great, your love was greater. What could separate us now? What a wonderful name it is. What a wonderful name.
Let us pray. God, our provider, you have not fed us with bread alone, but with words of grace and life. Bless us in these your gifts, which we receive from your bounty, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. The Lord be with you. And with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift it to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right to give our thanks and praise. It is indeed right, our duty and our joy, that we should at all times and in all places Give thanks and praise to you, almighty and merciful Father, through our Savior, Jesus Christ. You call your people to cleanse their hearts and prepare with joy for the Paschal Feast, that renewed in the gift of baptism, we may come to the fullness of your grace. And so, with all the choirs of angels, with the church on earth and the host of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of heart and light, heaven and earth are full of your glory. The Hosanna, the Hosanna, the Hosanna in the highest. Blessed are you, O God of the universe. Your mercy is everlasting and your faithfulness endures from age to age. Praise to you for creating the heavens and the earth. Praise to you for saving the earth from the waters of the flood. Praise to you for bringing the Israelites safely through the sea. Praise to you for leading your people through the wilderness to the land of milk and honey. Praise to you for the words and deeds of Jesus, your anointed one. Praise to you for the death and resurrection of Christ. Praise to you for the spirit poured out on all nations. In the night in which he was betrayed, our Lord Jesus took bread and gave thanks. Broke it and gave it to his disciples, saying, Take and eat. This is my body given for you. Do this for the remembrance of me. Again after supper, he took the cup, gave thanks, and gave it for all to drink, saying, This cup is a new covenant in my blood, shed for you and for all people for the forgiveness of sin. Do this for the remembrance of me. With this bread and cup, we remember our Lord's Passover from death to life as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ, Christ has died. Christ, Christ is risen. Christ, Christ will come again. again. O God of resurrection and new life, pour out your Holy Spirit on us and on these gifts of bread and wine. Bless this feast. Grace our table with your presence. Come, come Holy Spirit. Reveal yourself to us in the breaking of the bread. Raise us up as the body of Christ for the world. Breathe new life into us. Send us forth burning with justice, peace, and love. Come, Holy Spirit. With your holy ones of all times and places, with the earth and all its creatures, with sun and moon and stars, we praise you, O God, blessed and holy trinity, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Let us pray as Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Come, for all is now ready.
Christ strengthen you and keep you in his grace. Amen. Let us pray. Compassionate God, you have fed us with the bread of heaven. Sustain us in our Lenten pilgrimage. May our fasting be hunger for justice, our alms a making of peace, and our prayer the song of grateful hearts. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior and Lord. Amen. Amen. Let's bow our heads and our hearts as we receive God's blessing. Almighty God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, bless you now and forever. Amen. Amen.
Gotta waste and feed the Lord.